Welcome to the Bronx Aerosol Arts Documentary Project. My name is Stephen Payne, Librarian and Archivist at the Bronx County Historical Society. Today is June 1st, 2022. Uh, Kurt, you want to introduce yourself? Yeah, I'm Kurt Boone. I've been documenting urban culture here in New York uh, 40 plus years. Great. And we're very excited to be here with uh, uh, graffiti pioneer Keon, uh, an ex Vandel um, as well, and uh, uh, really uh, prolific uh, uh, artist working uh, in, with sculptures and really across a lot of different mediums as well. Um, so uh, happy to be here. And Keon, why don't you uh, start off by talking about your family's history and background and whatever you might know about how they ended up in New York and eventually Brooklyn. Um, eventually Brooklyn. Well, hello, this is Keon Wan, X Vandels. Shout out to everybody out there watching this interview. Uh, especially to my Rocky 184. Hope you like the interview, Shug. All right. Uh, my family background is my father is from the Bronx originally. Uh, his father was a police officer. He, uh, his father was one of uh, six brothers, uh, which have all now passed away. My mother is from the Midwest, from Iowa, a natural corn girl. They uh, both started in their history uh, in television at CBS. Oh, wow. My father was a cameraman uh, on the uh, Captain Kangaroo show, Walter Cronkite's new show, the NFL Today, before he switched all into sports. Uh, his father was uh, shot and killed when he was 18 uh, by the mob up in the Bronx. And uh, he told me never to be a hero and mind your own business. Yeah. Uh, my mother, on the other hand, started as the uh, secretary to um, uh, Arthur Gottfried, and she traveled all with Arthur Gottfried all over the place and was his private secretary, and uh, basically she was a housewoman, but she worked all the time. And I have uh, two sisters, and I'm the oldest. You're the oldest, I'm okay. I'm the oldest. Okay. And the prettiest. And the prettiest. <laughs> if you haven't noticed already. <laughs> uh, where, where, where did you all live uh, while you were growing up? We were gro we, I grew up in Brooklyn, Flatbush, Brooklyn. And um, it was a different Brooklyn at that time, uh, as all the boroughs were very different. Mm -hmm. There was no such thing as a beeper or a bike lane when I was growing up. Uh, my home station was Church Avenue okay. off of Flatbush. That's the BMT, the D train, and the M train. And uh, that's where I started to look at the trains and uh, get my interest from gra of graffiti. Sure, yeah. sure, sure. And did, I, I, I'm guessing did a lot of your father's family, did they still live in the Bronx when you were growing up? Most of them are dead. Yeah, yeah. But they did grow up in the Bronx and kind of scattered around, moving maybe up to Westchester. Yeah, uh, But yeah. most of my Italian family is passed on. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. would, would you visit either your father's or, mother, or mother's <coughs> family very often when you were growing up? Uh, yeah. Well, yeah, all of my uh, all of my uh, family was originally from the Bronx. Is the family that I saw, and when I grew up in a Catholic Italian uh, household. Sure. And my mother, being the wasp that she is, uh, she didn't really have too much religion other than you know Sunday school and just being a good Christian. And uh, we got to go visit them maybe once every other year. Oh, okay. Fly back to Iowa and see my aunt Mary and so on and so forth. My cousins. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. um, what, what what was it like going to Iowa from uh, being a Brooklyn kid? <laughs> Interesting, quiet. That's really all I can <laughs> remember. Really <laughs> I remember I went to my uh, my cousin's uh, wedding. It was one of the reasons I came back. It was probably 1981, and I got so drunk that I threw up on my grandmother's lawn <laughs> after coming home from the celebration. Everyone was very happy with me, I could tell you that much. <laughs> Absolutely. Demon alcohol. <laughs> and uh, uh, when, when, you, when you visit the Bronx uh, and your family in the Bronx, where, where did your family live in the Bronx? They grew up uh, in the uh, Arthur Avenue area. Okay, sure, okay. sure, sure, that makes sense, yeah. yeah. A few Italian enclaves, but that's, yeah, 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 yeah. that's in the biggest. Um, and uh, what kinds of things... Do you remember about your neighborhood when you were growing up, uh, the kind of people who lived in your neighborhood, things that you all would do out in the streets for fun? Or Yeah, uh, let's see. Um, well, Flatbush was a different story over there, and there was a lot of Jews that lived there that eventually moved out or pushed out when the African-American community came in, and then they got pushed out by the West Indian sure. community. And it's basically it looks the same, but it's it's a different flavor over there. What was the second part of the question? Uh, what kinds of things would you <laughs> do for fun in the, around the neighborhood? 
Well, I had a, a lot of kids that lived around me and they used to come onto my block, which was a dead end block, so there's no traffic except for East 21st Street as the dead end block kind of came out. It was on East 21st Street. And uh, we would play a lot of games, you know, we'd play stickball and scully and football, you know. Go touch to this, football. Go to this, yeah, touch football. Go to the station wagon and make a button hook and then the ball will be right there, you know how it goes. <laughs> And uh, I had a friend by the name of Paul Carusi, whose father was the uh, foreman at the garden, who changed the floors, and then he'd always bring his hockey sticks or whatever wow. he could find, and Paulie didn't want him because he, he had had enough. Yeah. So we got to play with some professional sticks. And on top of my father's job with the uh, NFL, he always brought something home as a souvenir. Yeah. Yeah, whether yeah. it was a jersey or was something. So I was the first kid on the block with the ABA basketball. And I do have a funny story that my father brought me home with the Duke, which is a football that was signed by Pete Rozelle. And, uh, of course, the sewer has a little bit of a hole in it, so you could put the football in as a, as a stand. <laughs> and my friend Louie, he kicked the ball out onto East 21st Street, and there went the Duke. Got stuck under a passing cab, <laughs> right under the wheel well, and there went the Duke. Yeah, I.O. Silva. Classic New York. Classic New York. Yeah. You, know, we, you know, we did things like we played manhunt, and, you know, it was yeah. quiet block, but it had a lot of friends came, and we just kind of played. Yeah, yeah, right, yeah, 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 yeah. So, so what was your uh, elementary school years like? Did you draw? My elementary you, school oh, years like were... Math, uh, history, right, or... Well, my, my elementary school was uh, not good because I never heard of people outgrowing it, but I had a severe dyslexic problem, which they did not kind of catch and socially promoted me until the 10th grade when I finally got kicked out of school and uh, then went to a 600 school where you were allowed to in Manhattan... So I'll get back into that in a second. And uh, so school was a little bit hard for me. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. Uh, it kind of gave you this rebellious attitude a little bit. You know, the school, you know, kind of people calling you stupid. But I was very popular. Yeah. But in their mind, just, you know, I wasn't catching up. So I ended up going to, you know, special help and tutors and da-da-da. And I think I've outgrown it because I read pretty damn well. As a matter of fact, I read Roxanne a bedtime story every night. <laughs> She loves seven, uh, Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs. She says she goes out with Grumpy. And, uh, you know, that's what it was. I mean, sure. you know, got the mother and the father, the neighborhoods, and uh, was close to my father's side of the family. Yeah. Uh, so I had to marry, Mary Zangetti was my aunt with the big black beehive from the B-52s. <laughs> and, uh, yeah. So, uh... What years was that in elementary school? That was uh, from, well, let's, let's see, I'm 62 years old now. I guess that was from, you know, 66. kindergarten. Like 66 to 72, right? Like, Something like that. I mean, what am I, a mathematician? <laughs> I don't know. Uh, it was, I was young, but, you know, I had a lot of trouble, and I got into, like, a rebellious kind of, you know, frame of mind, yeah, which yeah, yeah. probably is what stemmed me to do graffiti. Yeah, sure. You know. Sure. Wait, were there um, were there <coughs> many gangs in your neighborhood when you were growing up? There was, you know, there there was not many, but I remember that the uh, Savage Skulls were all tradition. over the place, and you know, I lived about four blocks away from Parkside Avenue, the M the M train station. Okay. And uh, Parkside was, you know, it was a different it was a different kind of a Brooklyn, you know. The boroughs were not mixed with transgenders and the Mexican population, the Arab. It was black, Spanish, or white. Yeah. Hmm. That was it. There were three, three dimensions in our world back then. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. 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 Uh, okay, yeah, so yeah. Um, elementary, uh, did you ride the trains in elementary or you just Elementary, you I, no, elementary I took a took a car that someone on my block, they were kind of passing by with their kids, so we had a little drop-off thing. Uh, and oh. it wasn't until, let's say, uh, I don't know, maybe sixth grade did I start taking the train, something like okay. that. Yeah. But okay. I took the train a lot into high school because that was in Manhattan. In Manhattan, sure, sure. Which is a whole nother storyline to talk about as far as transportation and how I got there and... Uh, yeah, yeah. What I saw on my travels. Absolutely. So, yeah. um, okay, so obviously you, you went from uh, elementary to junior high. And then, I did. And what was that experience like? Because in junior high, most New Yorkers, young kids take a transition because now you're into 
girls, fashion, oh, yeah. games, a lot of stuff. Is I was always in into girls, the slut that I am. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. So what junior high? You remember what school it was? I went to uh, to junior high school at, in, in Manhattan on 74th Street at Robert Louis Stevenson, which was not deemed a 600 school, but in fact it was. There was maybe 100 people that were in the school and maybe only 40 people showed up okay. at a time. So a lot of the kids had, you know, uh, learning problems, fidgety problems. They had some problems. A lot of them came from kind of upper middle class families. It was an expensive school. Yeah. Uh, just to teach you how to smoke cigarettes in class. <laughs> my father, I swear <coughs> to God, he almost he, he almost wanted to sue the school. Look what you did to my son, now he's smoking. <laughs> Wow. Smoking in class. It was a lot of there was a lot of strange kids in that school. Yeah, and uh, it's still there. The school is still there. Uh, everything is ironed down and locked up, and you know, it plexiglass like, windows and so the whole it was thing. A private school. It was a private. It was a private kind of six hundred school. It was for kids that weren't making it in regular school. But uh, but it was a public school. No, it was a private school. It's a private school. Yeah. Oh, so yeah, your parents paid. Yeah, they had to pay. Through oh. their fucking noses, if you don't yeah, uh, mind me telling you. Yeah, yeah, okay. okay. Yeah. But was that was the name of that elementary school though? If you the, my elementary, yeah, yeah. it was Brooklyn Friends School. Brooklyn Friends School. Brooklyn Another Friends school. school, right? Yeah, and it was a private school. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And uh, that's yeah, interesting. Yeah. So you had to take the train from Brooklyn <laughs> to junior high school in Manhattan. Yeah. How was that like? Uh, that was a uh, that was a nice long ride, and you know uh, I'm not a king, I'm not a legend, I'm not a huge writer, uh, but I did my little dibble daddle, daddle, and uh, I used to take the uh, train with this guy named uh, KK, who was an African American gentleman, and his father worked for the UN, and he lived up across the Brooklyn Museum, so KK and me would take the train every morning, and you know. Uh, get on the train, travel the train all the way up to 72nd Street Station, Broadway, and ride in between the cars and have a little bit of a, one of those mini little spray cans from the hardware store or yeah. something. And we would get up from car to car in between in between the trains. Oh, wow. Okay. Just okay. in between the trains. Not yeah. only, uh, in between in the between two cars. The okay. yeah. Let's make that clear for that viewing audience. <laughs> He was riding between the cars. Yeah, we were riding between the cars. And, uh, you know, that's where we felt comfortable. Of course, you could smoke a Marlboro out there or anything else KK might have brought with him. <laughs> yeah. That's pretty young. At 10 years, 12 years old. Well, you know how it goes, you know. That's you know pretty young, goes, man. <laughs> like I said, once a slut, always a slut. Oh, yeah. So you're riding trains. We're riding the trains. And, you know, that brought me into uh, Manhattan, where in high school then... Uh, I uh, I hung a lot lot out in the park, and that's where I met a lot of guys that I hang out with now. Yeah. And uh, one of my cl- close closer crew kind of people, uh, such as the good Doctor Revolt and uh, Eric Famous Hayes, he looks good whether he's got a bald head or a full head of hair. I'm going to tell you, a handsome guy. And. Uh, uh, I met Min at the Newkirk Avenue station, who was part of that crew when we were really young. As a matter of fact, there's a, a famous picture of him going like this next to his NE piece that could have been on the M train where he has a pair of red puma on and wow. short hair. If you ever see that picture, that's when I met him. Wow. And uh, of course, Raymond uh, Rasta, who's passed away, RIP. And um, Bill Rock, of course, and uh, just... Uh, Guys from the park were LSD and uh, Clyde and Frankie and Schick and Peabody and Aztec and Earl Poet. Mm. So these were, especially that last kind of paragraph, those are the people that I really admired. And ironically enough now, I hang out and paint with Frankie and Clyde. By the way, Frankie, you are number one. Clyde? (laughs) He's got better legs than Frankie does. Always tan there, Clyde. Always complaining. You know, he was a motor man. Yeah. So, so Keon, you went, yeah. you went from uh, junior high to high school. No, actually, from, I took a year off. I can't finish the question. But, but no, yeah, but no, I was saying, because you jumped to high school, schoolyard. So uh, I wanted to, like, just uh, put together the junior high and then the, the high school, because you, we didn't need to say what high school yet. Well, I went to Robert Louis Stevenson on 74th Street, and there That's were a couple. High. No. Ten, 
10th grade, 9th, 10th, 11th, 12th. That's junior oh, high. No, uh, Are you trying to confuse me, Kurt? No. <laughs> high school is 9 to 12. Junior high is 6 to 9. I don't know. I switched schools when I was kicked out of school in 10th grade. I mean, everything else is a blur. Right, I'm, 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 my yeah. tutor's got all the records if you want to contact her. Right, but in my high school... There was kids from Manhattan, and one of them, and probably my most influential guys, was the writer K.E. Three, otherwise known as Mousy. His first name was Barry Applebaum, mm. and he had uh, brown teeth and no teeth. The ones that he had left in his mouth were brown, yeah, and uh, long hair all the way down to his anus. Wow! And he was a parky, what they called the parky kids that lived in the park and okay. played frisbee and. But he was KE3, and he had a wild style tag. And uh, he was probably my biggest influence. Wow. He was a guy that wrote Monty. And down the block was a guy by the name of Orion. That's what he wrote. And he became a friend of mine. But he went to Baldwin School. And uh, there was a couple of other writers that kind of came through my school. But when I got into visual arts, there was more writers that I met there. And that was Eric Hayes and... Uh, Keith Haring had gone to school there for a year, but he was not a friend of mine in school. He yeah. had kind of left. And uh, I think that Barry Applebaum, KE3, was my first. I want to go back to junior, I want to go back to grammar school because there was a kid that lived in Cobble Hill and his name was Ian Phillips. He was in my class. And uh, he took notice, I took notice, he took, uh, he, he was the first guy that I saw piecing on a piece of paper during class, and I kind of huh. looked over to him. That was nice, and before you know it, I was kind of doodling with that too. There's okay. Ian Phillips. So that, that lived in Cobble Hill. When you yeah, yeah, okay. Ian Phillips, Cobble Hill. KE3 and Ian were my first guys. And then, of course, there was my best friend, still to this day, Joust One, mm. JD, Johnny Doe. And uh, he influenced me a lot in graffiti. We had met uh, on our skateboards. Uh, on uh, Cortelia Street Fair and we've been friends ever since but uh, JD was uh, he's the man and he was uh, he was a big influence on me not only style but just in his interest yeah yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. so um, what was your uh, first Rocky love you Rocky what, 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 I'm going to give you that praise girl what's your, what's your, I love, what's, I love what's that Rocky she's a badass woman what's your first writing name you my first that? writing name, interesting, because uh, I went to, uh, my initials are Cal, C-A-L. So I had kind of written that uh, in school, like all over the walls and all over desks. I went to Mad Cal, M-A-D-C-A-L. Yeah. Uh, I tried out text, but I had nothing to do with text. We didn't even have text messages then. I don't know why. I wasn't <laughs> from fucking Texas. And then Keon came in, and Keon derives from the Eddie Kendricks song, mm. Keep It On, Keep On Trucking. Oh, that's where oh. Keon comes from. He keep on, yeah, keep on, keep on, keep okay. on sure, sure, and sure. my man. Wow, yeah, wow. that's where Keon comes from. And do, do, you keep keeping on, and you don't stop. <laughs> <laughs> do, do you remember about when you started writing Keon? <sighs> uh, I don't know. Just before I got kind of kicked out of school. Oh, okay, okay, yeah, somewhere around yeah, there. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, I'm probably the only guy that got left back, kicked out, and then went to visual arts and got left back because of my credits for the English. Come on, who wow, does that? Wow. But Chris Poppy, thank God I sat next to him in, 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 uh, in art history class because I cheated off him. He was a good man. <laughs> he did a piece for me on my, you know, because we sat next to him all the time. Yeah. I still have it, but Roxanne now thinks it's hers. I got another thing coming to you, girl. I'll tell you later. So, so what did you do in the year between uh, uh, the, the the private school and uh, 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 visual art? I took off. I went to the, uh, you know, I had to kind of find myself, and I had an art teacher in this small school who, uh, very quiet, gay, not that that makes a difference, but she really liked me, and she thought that I had a little bit of talent, so she kind of helped me get along, and she helped me kind of get into knowing about visual arts. And I took a year off. I went to the Art Students League for some drawing classes, uh, and I kind of wasn't... I was into it, but I kind of already knew, like, what I was doing, and I could hardly wait to get out of there to go work, because I worked at the Roxy Roller Disco uh -huh. as a skate guard then, and I worked there for... Uh, 
for five years at Roxy. Wow. And so this is, I was really a roller skater, a professional roller skater at that discotheque. And you know what goes on at those discos. There's a lot of sniffing and there's a lot of poking and there's a lot of girls. And uh, it was a good time at yeah. Roxy Roller Disco. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now my heart belongs to only one, though. Only one Roxy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's right. Uh, she told me to say all the right things in here. <laughs> You're checking all the boxes. Yeah. Uh, so, so you, uh, you, you, you had an inkling that through, through teachers that you might be good at art. But you didn't really pursue it. You were well, just, you know what? As a little kid, like, you know, I spent a lot of time coloring. I loved to color okay. in comic books, I mean, in, in coloring books. And I wasn't really much of a sketcher. But by the time I got to high school and was painting, you know, with acrylic paint, it was easy for me. And then when I started to look at, at art, you know, general fine art, I was like, God, I could do that. Okay. You know, kind of thing. And that's how I kind of just stayed with what was true. Yeah. I wasn't really a book smart dude. Um, I wasn't going into finance and I wasn't doing this, so I pursued my career in doing something that came easy, and that was kind of art. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So when, you, when you're hanging with your friends in the <coughs> schoolyard who are, are writers, were uh, Dr. Revolt and any crews? Like, what crews were around at that time? Well, the big crew for me in high school was RTW, Rolling Thunder, and I forgot to mention uh, Andy Zephyr, who was a huge influence as far as someone that had wired that craft of lettering and color and bits and shapes to me back then. And uh, we both had a uh, an in-common girlfriend up there, the Stern Sisters, which one of them is dead now for ODing, but she ended up uh, having a roller skate rental out in the eastern end of Long Island at some of the bars. And I remember... Um, Andy coming out to her store and did a huge, and I wish I had the picture of it now because it was an insane piece that said Sun Skates, which was the name of her store. I don't know why I'm bringing up Andy, and, but I just forgot him from RTW. And sure. That was one of the big crews. The other crew was uh, that I was not in was uh, the BYB, the Bad Yard Boys, or the Brand Nice Yards Boys, which now some of the legends that I used to look at, such as, you know, Kit 17, uh, Billy, uh, Mark 198, and all the MG boys, Peace MG boys, Peace to Kid 17 out there. Kid, can you see me? Your turn's coming up, kid. Uh, BYB, 3YB. 3YB. Are they the same or 3Y is different? You know, I don't know that. All right. That's one thing I really don't know. I imagine that they're affiliated. The other group was TC, uh, which was Jester's crew, who was one of my all time favorite graffiti tags. And he was TC. And uh, James Top. Oh, the Top crew. James, well, the Top, top the, the Odd Partners the stands odd for partners. Top. Some of, some people call it thousands of pieces, but it's really the Odd Partners. Sure. So Top was a big group, and uh, in high school too, uh, one of my one of my crews that you know that I I got put into a lot of crews. Okay. Whether it was RTW or. NCB, which was the No Comp Boys, and that was Roto's group from Brooklyn. Mm -hmm. Big shout out to Roto. What's going on, David? And uh, that was a, a big crew. And uh, GND, which is Graffiti Never Dies, mm -hmm. was uh, kids that I didn't know growing up, like in high school. Uh, the Kelly, Kelly Park Boys, which is in Brooklyn, kind of Sunset Park area kind of deal. And uh, my good friend, uh, Trike, Trike One, took that over, took GND's crew over. And Trike was a big dude, all-city basketball player. And uh, I don't know if he's all-city now, basketball player. I mean, <laughs> only me and Trike could talk about that. You know about that, Trike. Uh, he was, Trike was a big influence, a big dude. Nobody ever messed with him. He was a big dude, kind of like T-Kid, was a big dude. And... Uh, uh, Doc, who's a big guy. Nobody messed with Trike. He had a, you know, he had not only respect, but he was a big guy. He didn't take shit from nobody. So if you were hanging out with Trike, it was a, a good, safe guy to be with. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. I forgot the rest of that question. Okay, no, you're, you're good, you're good. I'm not answering it, but, um, yeah. okay, so... The Cruise, TC, which yeah, I was not the in. The Cruise, I mean, it isn't right. mainly the high school, what we're talking about. Like, high school? High school, yes, but high school, high school. as it goes into college, right? So you can, yeah. like, merge it, but during that time... Yeah. 
75, 76 guys were hitting trains. True, they were they hitting were doing trains. Pieces on trains. They were doing pieces on trains before it got, got into a uh, a interest on canvas when Europe, you know, graffiti, like I was telling you outside, the graffiti has had lots of changes, yeah. resurgence of interest, especially in the early 80s when the Europeans started to collect canvases. Mm -hmm. And my thing is that I liked graffiti, but I didn't like the way the aerosol can, it had a different effect when it was on canvas. It was just stuck. I liked it on the wall. I liked it shine on the wall, so on and so forth. And um, I forgot what I was going to say. I'm, I'm having senior moments. Yeah, you were saying that uh, the air is how the air is a different how graffiti goes up and down depending on the era. Yeah, I mean, it got a resurgence, and that's when people such as you know Crash and uh, Say Adams, Say City, and uh, Dandi and Futura, and uh, just to name a few. Um, I think that Lee was doing that, and um, too. And as far as I'm concerned, just to kind of get off the question, he was probably my biggest influence as an artist that did artwork on top of graffiti on the trains. Mm -hmm. And Lee did it in whole cars that were amazing to the art itself with the kind of caliber and the... Um, the intensity of character and color and kind of scenery and stories that anyone else was doing. By far the best, as far as I'm, Lee Cononis. Hats off to you, Lee. Absolutely. And uh, on top of that, too, he was using just regular kind of cans. You know, he also, too, broke the mold for real artwork and characters coming in on the trains was which was his canvas, as opposed to other guys, you know, making an occasional star or cloud, some zigzags in their name, which was intense at that point for them in the early 70s. Yeah. And I would like to say that uh, my earliest influences standing on the uh, Church Avenue station in 19... I don't know, what is it? 19... Maybe 70, 71, 72... The guys that I looked up to on the train and that I saw, whether they came from the Bronx, which I believe that most of them, some of them were from Brooklyn, and that was on the D and the M because that was my line, the BMT. I saw people like Comet, yeah. who to this day, and I've just met him over the last, you know, eight years. He was one of my childhood graffiti heroes, mm -hmm. as was Jester. And I always admired the guy that wrote CA, Commercial Artist Captain America, whatever you call him. Guys like uh, Taro, TJ159, who doesn't get any kind of credit, as far as I'm concerned, I hear about talks about old writers. Yeah. Um, uh, all one, and there's probably a couple of them, but you know, coffee hasn't finished, and I'm just wondering. And, and with, with those tags, the, 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 your kind of earliest memories of, of those tags, was there already a style element at play in those tags or character, like, you know, basic characters? Yeah, there wasn't really created? too many characters. I mean, I never <clears throat> met him to this day. I know that Stay High had yeah. his stick figure guy that also, to one of the early pioneers, Lava 1 and 2, he used that stick man character too. Uh, special shout out to Lava, rest in peace. Also, rest in peace, Nick 707. Terrible that we lost him during the COVID years. Mm -hmm. Everyone was sad, and he was a good man. Wore a GoPro on his hat, and um, those were those were kind of some of the writers. Cliff, that I saw come on the train, and you know they had all these wild bubble letters, and it was just yeah. something very uh, rebellious. Something very graffiti was always an underground culture, mm -hmm. kind of like skateboarding was an yeah. underground culture, and I was very part very much so part of the skateboarding in the city, kind of before skateboarding got popped. I was one of those guys. So like a Zoo York. It was Zoo York, the soul artist, yes, and, uh, yeah. which brings me to another guy, Andy Kessler, who was yeah. uh, one of my dearest good friends at that point, and we hung out in the park with the likes of those other people that I had mentioned, sure. especially the RTW boys. So what was she was? Uh, Robert Chris Lewis 217, Steve? let's not forget him. Robert, and, what, uh, what, what street was Robert Louis Stevenson? It was 74th between oh, okay, Columbus so and so Central Park. So it's right there by the 72nd Street entrance. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was all the action. Yeah, yeah, 74th Street, yeah. Uh, 
right down over here. You wrote Keon. I wrote Keon. Uh, did, did you uh, put pieces on a train? No, 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 no. You know, I, 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 now that I've listened to a lot of people talk about what they did or didn't do and how much is belief and how much is not belief, yeah. you know, graffiti for me stemmed from a rebellious alter ego. I was not a piecer on the train. I was a street tagger, truck tagger, station tagger. Mm. Had some tags on the trains, but not a lot. But I was not a piecer. Like I said, I am just a guy that was part of the culture from the early 70s to watching it, yeah. through your teenage years, through high school, and into college. And when I went to college and finished college, the School of Visual Arts gave me a job as a teaching assistant in the sculpture department. Mm. Um, and the likes of some kids like uh, Aaron Sharp, uh, Luster from the village, and Stash 2 from the village. They were an elf NPC from the Bronx. Mm. They were all my students. Oh. So they come to the first year and there's a mandatory sculpture class that they have to take to fulfill their, their you know... Be a, yeah. yeah their, whatever it's called. Yeah, yeah. 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 Right. So I had those kids when they were young. Wow. And uh, yeah, that was interesting because... I was able to talk about, you know, the Dance Interior Club and, you know, the Chelsea area and the Village area. I also had a good friend by the name of uh, Polk, mm. who was from the Village. And he's the, he's the, uh, the son of uh, John Johnson, the news reporter. And uh, Polk uh, was a big writer in the, in the Village and a big truck writer. And uh, he hung out with the Go Club with Piggy and, and, and team. Uh, team. Um, so I met a lot of people through... That era. So I think that I've been through the different eras and now hang out with, you know, some of the legends and Shaman 65 and, of course, Rocky and uh, the girl legends and uh, Clyde and Frankie and Roger yeah. and uh, Cool Keto. And back to the styles back in Brooklyn in my neighborhood, it was kind of a little bit of a California style, meaning like it was kind of a gang and there was a thing. But remember, in my neighborhood, the ex Vandels were from that neighborhood. Uh-huh. Guys that I was one of my all-time favorite writers from the Expandels, Scooter. Mm. And if you look at the wall writer books, you'll see guys like Lazar, who had an amazing style for his L-A-Z-A-R style back when style was not even really a thing. It yeah. was, but he, he had mastered it as far as I was concerned. And you'll see all of that in the wall writer book from that kind if of era. Get one. <laughs> well, you know something, I, I know people, I can, I can hook you up. For oh, a small fee, of course, but I can help you out. Okay. Stevie already broke my leg once down there. Yeah, I gave him one for free. Right, we'll I got to ask Roxanne first, you know, because she's right. the boss. All right. All right. Yeah. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. But there was a different style, and, and guys like Littlefoot, Daddy Cool, these were the first guys that I saw mm. from my neighborhood. As a kid, let's say walking into Prospect Park, when I shouldn't have been walking there, when my friends going sleigh riding, because yeah. we were going through... You know, ex Vandels. And remember, the graffiti on the wall was very, it wasn't disturbing to me, but it was, um, what's the word that I'm looking for? It was a um, uh, senior moment. It was, uh, it was a mark of a, like, it, it had a bit of threat and scariness to yeah, it. Like it this was is our territory, right? Kind of like that. And that's not the word that I was looking for, but. Um, the graffiti on the wall kind of uh, had a um, uh, loss for words. But that's how kids were writing graffiti on the wall. Before yeah. the trains, and the trains, like I had told you outside, were a way for your name to move from borough to borough. Yeah. A trucks did that too. Anything that moved in your name as opposed to a schoolyard handball court, uh, it moved. And that's, you know, people had a, uh, this alter ego, like I said before, they were rebellious kids. And they come from all walks of life, whether you're rich, you're poor. They were, oh, graffiti writers were like the skateboarding kind of underground culture. Before it was out, there were certain guys that were in that culture. And the graffiti, the, the skateboarders too, wrote graffiti. So the two kind of cultures kind of yeah. blended together. It's hard for people to understand, but at least in my world they did. You know? Oh, it makes, it makes sense. So, yeah. so um I want to get into the egg band, but what kind of music were you into? Well, the, you know, like all the white boys, I was definitely okay, into, you know, Black Sabbath was right. the kings, and they still are the kings, right. and you know, 
you get into your little headphones, whatever you, whatever you had in the music, and before you know it, Led Zeppelin was playing and you were doing your little pieces on the paper. Yeah, 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 yeah. I know for me that that was good. And then we always had the Ohio players and Parliament Funkadelic sure. and uh, little James Brown kind of came into the mix. And that was probably because of Soul Train. And I used to sit glued looking at the booties on the Soul Train. <laughs> you know, I Dream, I Dream a Genie came on the TV, you know, and yeah, I used to get right. right up to that TV just to see if I could see Bush. That's cool. Yeah. So, so yeah. what was your introduction to the X family? And, well, the X and while we had it, do, yeah. do you have any photos of your early tags? Well, I do, but we'd have to put that on pause so I could fo find them on the phone, which you know runs our life, and it might take me a while to find mm. those things. Okay, well, I, you know, I, I, I find it really cool how people have pictures of their stuff. All I know is that myself and Joust did not have a camera. Yeah. We did not have a cell phone. I know I threw my beeper up against the wall when I had to go call someone back and go to a phone booth, and it wasn't working. I didn't have a cord. The beeper was another thing. Um, and um, my introduction to the ex-Vandels, who were my all-time kind of favorite crew and first crew that I knew that I was watching their graffiti. Intimidating was the word. Intimidating, that when graffiti sure. is in a neighborhood, it's intimidated. Yeah. If you go back to like the Wall Writers book where, you know, you have SJK and Mike and Wicked Gary, who was from Brooklyn, and the ex Vandel, um, the names of writing and tagging on the wall was first, mm -hmm. before the piece came out. And uh, taggers, wall writers, you know, and um, those were my first wall writing experiences with the ex Vandels and the kids in my neighborhood, the block. Yeah. Um, Dino Nod. Those were the people that I saw, whether they were gang affiliated or not. And remember, as a white kid in that changing neighborhood to, to the black, I was, uh, you know, I wasn't hanging out with the ex Vandels. Later on in life, that the ex Vandels have now become, you know, the kids that went to Walt Whitman or Erasmus in Brooklyn. Now, because of Wicked Gary, they have become a group that has festered into an all-time kind of worldwide, global crew. Yeah. So if you're putting up the ex Vandels and you're a street artist, which a lot of people have been let into that group, whether, group, whether you're from Europe or California or wherever the hell you're from, um, they're not the original ex Vandels. But ex Vandels has uh, expanded into like an art group too yeah, yeah, yeah. and I was uh, led into the ex Vandels, who was my childhood thing ironically you know a, a white kid from Church Avenue that looked at them is now in them and that goes for a lot of the people that I hang out with now in FDT and Clyde I wasn't part of their growing up the 56 boys uh, Hoy 56 I was not part of them but I am now because of the people that we are in and uh Anyone that sees this interview, especially Charmin, your turn's coming up, girl, and uh, Checker 170, who we give the praise to as one of the first original, whose style never changes mm -hmm. and was so relevant is modern because it's still relevant in today. We give uh, hats off to Checker 170, INDs. INDs was another big crew back then that I was not part of. Also, the other one now is, I think, back, The Mob, mm -hmm. T-Mob. That was a Broadway group. Right, and you were still talking about the ex <coughs> Right. Uh, there's you're not right. too much I have to say more about the ex Vandals other than they are a crew, a strong crew. They're nationwide, worldwide. And, uh, you know, without Wicked Gary, they wouldn't be uh, promoted and thought of like they, they were. Sure. But they were, they, you know, when I was a kid and seeing them, they, they were rowdy kids that were doing something that I wanted to do. Absolutely. But you weren't, you weren't part of, of them at that point. No, no, no. Time. I was just Went a white so kid from East 21st Street that yeah. played with Louie and Paulie and Danny and whoever else was around. Yeah, 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 yeah. But I started having my interest. And remember, at Church Avenue, I did see the Comet and the Cliff and the All, Sergeant Bones, uh, Hurst. Uh, these were first group, TJ. These were first guys that I wanted to be. Absolutely. I mentioned Tarot and T, T-E-E. -E. These were all... That was it. Was exciting, you know, because the graffiti was new then. Yeah. And uh, in the seventies, people got away with it. Yeah. When it came into the eighties, mm -hmm. it was a little bit more dangerous. And it seems as though that the the kids in the eighties, as mid to older teens, it was kind of a rowdy kind of thing that you know you had to go in to the train yard looking to maybe get vamp for your paint. Yeah. 
That's why I was talking about nobody ever messed with Tripe. Yeah. And T Kid was another one that you don't want to mess with him now. Yeah. As a matter of fact, you don't want to mess with him anytime. <laughs> What's up, T Kid? And uh, that's, you know, you get the idea with that. It was, it's a little bit more dangerous. The train started to get, uh, you know, fenced off in the sure. Koch administration, late into the Giuliani. We put everything in check. He, he wanted to introduce wolves. Yeah, the yeah, yeah. You know, so it got very hard and dangerous to do in the 80s, yeah. which the kids did in the 70s. And remember, in the 80s, graffiti had morphed into a, into more of a shaped and stylized letters. And you will see shades of that morphing with guys like Blade, who yeah. was one of the most innovative, say what you like about him, but he was the most innovative guy along with Lee, that brought in kind of... Even the thing that came out of the of the Village Voice, I believe, with his swinging... It's a famous picture of his swinging blade letters. That was, to me, and I saw that run, that was, to me, just, like, amazing. Yeah. And, you know, he, he had a he had a definitely a, a style. Where guys like Riff 170, even Checker to his bubble style... Sure. To guys like Billy, who I did not know, but I hear all about him th through Kit, uh, 17, MG Boys. Um, I hear, uh, you know, it, it's the style with, with the arrow. Yeah. Another great one that I watched a long time ago was Vinny, mm. who had the swinging, you know, the arrow on top of the uh, Y and his ends kind of looped around, which was, you know, very innovative for a letter. Yeah. But in the 80s, uh, when guys like, I'm just going to name maybe one without going too much, Mac, who I never met, and there was a, a, there was a definite wilder of a style that came yeah. out, not only with colors, not so much caps in cans, but with colors, they were just bright colors, and some of it you couldn't read, and some of it you couldn't make out. But it really definitely changed in the 80s and the early, when it was harder to do. Sure. You took more risks as a teenager than, than you did in the early 70s. So in the, in the 80s, you were a young adult, so what, what, <coughs> what are you doing in the art game? Are you, are you writing? Are you well, I'll tell you job? what, I'll you tell you what. What, what. I feel that I'm still writing. Especially when I go into a bathroom and no one can watch me. Yeah, yeah, so, <laughs> yeah. Of course I do. Of course yeah. I do. All right, all right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Roxanne says, "Don't leave the house without your marker." <laughs> you know how I roll. Uh, yeah, you know, whenever you can. Just the other day, me and Kit were in uh, Williamsburg, and you know, he stopped and he took a tag, and he goes, "Come on, you punk!" And I, I took a tag too. <laughs> he goes, "That's your only tag," and uh, a good place I said, to tag. "No." <laughs> and uh, you know, I had a lot of stations too. You know, underneath the staircases, the permies on the bottom. Sure. Do I expect people to remember me? Yeah, I remember. I don't really expect it. I can't even remember myself. Yeah. yeah. Wow. And uh, graffiti was an important part of my life, even into my art career. I know we're kind of getting off the questions, but there's a certain kind of flow, especially in the 80s when things were arrows and bits and dot, dot, dot. dot. That flow of graffiti and the energy... I hope transforms into my own sculpture work or my painting work, which sure. I still do because that's just kind of part of me and I need to make a living, so that's how I'm making a li living, whether it's my window work, uh, my painting on windows for the store for the holidays, or it's selling my maps or my canvases, <coughs> and you know, it's on my own hustle, on my own art gallery. I forgot the questions that I went okay, back so, to. Okay, so in the 80s, well, yeah. how, how did you transition as an artist? Well, in the, like I said, I had this, you know, high school teacher and uh, working at the Roxy I still did my thing and I had a studio until probably a big loft that I did my sculpture in. but you know when you're making stuff and it's big and you need a place to make it in storage eventually that building sold and I lost that space and mm -hmm. time had gone by and the neighborhoods had changed and rents for lofts and it's another rent and it's kind of a how you can afford to have a studio yeah. this big and build this kind of stuff that takes a while to build and you're not able to move it right away and you can't keep up with production with that type of sculpture work. And I don't know if I can find a picture uh, to have you look at it, but um, it was hard to keep up. So I went into, you know, with, with making art and I lost the studio. 
And what was the question again? You know, you're transitioning in the 80s and you're becoming an artist, right? Right. Out of, out, outside of the graffiti thing, right. you know the graffiti thing, right. but you're actually becoming yeah, an artist. Yeah, well, you know what? There was, you know, going to school visual arts, it's not only did it open doors, but I worked for a lot of my teachers oh. who were already mm. 57th Street um, acclimated in the art world, in the art news uh, magazine, yeah. and, you know, in the certain high galleries, uh, such as Marjorie Strider, Joel Perman, Robert Loeb, Richard Van Buren, just the likes of these, Barbara Schwartz, likes of these kind of people that I worked with. So they turned me on to, you know, what it could be and what I could turn into be. And because I'm a motor mouth talking, I got a job there with the uh, school and I worked there for seven years. And the East Village was also a big thing that kind of got my... Uh, I guess my motor going and really kind of, you know, look, this is what you're doing, make the best of it and uh, try and sell it in the galleries, which there were an abundance of galleries coming into the East Village. Sure. They were brand new. And two people that I went to school with, uh, Nina uh, and Mario, uh, Mario's in the Philippines, now, they were the ones that opened up the new math gallery. And because I was a painter and a taper and a plaster and I had a good friend, Artie May, who was very bright with construction and changing joists and you know the whole thing for cheap because they didn't have the money the gallery needed Mario didn't have the money to pay people to do it so the people that were part of their stable of artists like myself and Artie and a couple of other people um, would do a lot of the work for them and uh, I kind of forgot the question but that was my intro, in, that's introduction that's into art through the East Village which was a different place than it is now yeah like if you went down to 13th Street and Avenue A in the village you know you better be packing a gun because there was a lot of heroin back then sure 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 and uh, you know there was it was rowdy to walk down Houston Street even as a big guy it was you yeah know, it was rowdy to walk down there and, and you have that uh, <laughs> that tag you showed me on your phone uh, in front of CBGB's oh, was yeah. that your scene at all or you just happened to well tag you know like the that building? Was, yeah that was a couple of landmark places and that's all due to my friend Joust oh okay sure. he's a smart guy like that he's still a smart guy and uh, he knew the permie spots that you know stayed up until they buffed them off a week later we had old Washington Square Park before they had grass in it yeah. all along the statues and that was insta fame for Joust and CBGB's was insta fame and sure, I'm sure. glad that I had the picture because it it says for all those haters that you know Oh, he had one tag at least. <laughs> Something like that. So, yeah, yeah. so how did you get into being a sculptor? What, what material did you use? Well, you know what? It's hard to talk about the sculpture right now because I don't have pictures to put up so you could see kind of where I'm coming from unless this phone still works. And I'll see if I, I'll see if I can get a picture to show you. Well, you can describe the material. Well, I use mixed media. And because I was not rich enough, I used uh, found objects. All right. Found <laughs> objects right, were, because I found an object, okay. whether it's, you know, of a, a lampshade to, uh, you know, broken bamboo to whatever, all those materials have a story. The materials has a story and they speak of a language and when they're mixed, the final product speaks of a language as your mixed media. And a lot of my mixed media would come out of um, uh, would come out of um, you know the dumpsters, which I was a definite dumpster diver, <laughs> and uh, yeah, and that's how I got it. And I picked it up on my bike. I had an El Camino at one point, which helped as a car. Sure. And uh, I rode a lot of materials back uh, on my bicycle back to my studio. And uh, I have one pictures of the. Um, Linus Cruello, uh, yeah. he's, he's a gra considered graffiti and Who's a sculpture. That? He does a lot of... Who is uh, this you're speaking of? Uh, he's a, a sculptor, but he's... A sculptor. Yeah, a sculptor, but he's also known for his graffiti using found objects. And who, who is this you're speaking Linus, of? Linus, L-I-N-U-S-C-O-O. Well, I, I, I never heard of him, yeah. but that doesn't mean anything because I never heard of him. No, he's, he's from New York, so I thought you yeah. might have heard of him. But um, he was in New York 
<coughs> an early New York show with Futura uh -huh. and some of the other oh, yeah. Crash and some of the other early yeah. pioneers. Right. But he has sculptures in, your, in, in, yeah. in that show. And you know, not only are they pioneers of the graffiti culture, but they're definitely pioneers of the graffiti turns art mm -hmm. on canvas. They're definitely those people that you mentioned, Days. They, they're other, they're writers that took it on canvas to sell overseas because there's, like I said, the graffiti has an interest that resurges every time. Just think now, a guy like me is here. You yeah. know, you guys are looking to, you know, interview guys that will give you a little bit of, you know, history about graffiti, not just about you know, themselves but or their selves in graffiti, but in general graffiti. It was easier to write graffiti back then. When you look at the wall writers, it was illegal. Yeah. Let's not forget that. Never mind your art career. Never mind how famous you are. It was an illegal thing to do. You were a punk ass kid. You had a spray can. You wrote your name on the wall. Whippy wahoo. You and your friends looked at it. I'm up over here before you know it. The trains came. People are writing. They're going from borough to borough. And it's an ego thing. Any way you want to slice it. Whether you're an artist, a good graffiti artist, which got deemed also to by the bougie mm -hmm. crowd. And I'm not going to start naming people that have documented graffiti because I know them and they're friends of mine or they're collectors of mine sure. with my canvases, mm -hmm. not my graffiti canvases. But when people write about anything, they write about it from Manhattan. Whether it's musician, they're always talking about Manhattan because mm -hmm. Manhattan is the mecca. It's New York, Manhattan. The other boroughs where you see these great writers where these kids come out of different boroughs that we talk about in the history of the early 70s, they're not recognized because they're from Staten Island, they're from Brooklyn, they're from Queens. They're not, people are not recognized like the people from Manhattan or the people that come to soil the Royal Oats and get their start. They start in Manhattan because it's money they can Manhattan. The other boroughs, as far as anything else is concerned, is secondary. Now you look at Brooklyn, and Brooklyn has definitely morphed into something else. It gets a lot more credit. Yeah. You hear more about Brooklyn. Yeah. You still don't hear about Queens too much. No. Uh, remember, no. back in those days, Queens was very, it was like a suburb. Yeah. Brooklyn was, but it still had a rowdiness to it. It had a, you know, whether the Brooklyn Dodgers came in or the Coney Island. Brooklyn has always had its kind of own history. Sure, sure. Uh, but now it's a, it's a different thing. It's yeah. Different thing. So when, when you first started getting into writing, um, we can go back to, to sculpture um, in a little bit. Yeah. Sculpture, um, remember, is one of those things where you need a space yeah, to do sculpture. Absolutely. You need to put your tools there. You need to have your materials there. I'm not doing sculpture anymore, much to my chagrin. I'd love to be able to do that. But it's a matter of either building something small and collecting it and keeping it out on Rocky's Terrace. Yeah, yeah. Because she promised me a studio. <laughs> but she gave me a rose garden instead. You know what I mean? And uh, I, so I haven't gone back into my sculpture because it's a whole different swing about how you have to make it. Yeah. And sell it yeah. and move it. It's a lot more of a boom, boom, boom process. Whereas a painter, sure. you can paint in someone's living room and you know make a make a painting, yeah. which I happen to use Rocky's kitchen as my studio, okay. and she's furious with it. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, and, but but with writing, did did you first start with uh, with markers or did you go? Straight I start to with markers. Hand? Start with you know back in back in the in the lat, latter part, I had a good friend that worked over by the Newkirk Avenue station, who my boy Joust knows too. Yeah. And uh, and I, I, I do want to mention NSA because in the early any in the early eighties, that was one of the crews that I was in it was mm -hmm. nonstop action NSA, and that was a uh, rebel and star, and bass, and joust, and scale, and wow. you know, the names just go on. That was part of our crew, nonstop action. Sure. Rebel LaBoy, what's up, Rebs? And uh, that's pretty much uh, pretty much that, and I forgot exactly where we are on the... You were still uh, looking for a sculpture there. Yeah, the painting just became easier to do, and, um, you know, uh, you, you could paint on the streets, and... Um, so yeah, when you did your yeah. tag, did you yeah. uh, when you did spray paint, when you did spray paint art, what was your style? Was it bubble letters, wild no, style? No, my ta well, you know what? A tag does not really have too many bubble letters. Bubble letters came from the piece. Okay, mm -hmm. came from the piece. Okay. Well, pieces started out to be kind of, if you look at your history, that they kind of became 
bad, simple letters, as it morphed, it became a little bit more fluent. And sure. I believe for me, you know, those early first people, yeah, the early first people that um, I looked at had the bubble letter. Whereas sure. I call it the NCB letter because I think it came from uh, where well, you see it now in street art and street tags and a lot of street bombers now. Yeah. Especially after the pandemic, they, yeah, they, yeah, yeah, they were just let crazy. Um, the bubble letter came from guys like Comet, who I keep referring back to because he's one of those old school guys that does make paintings, whether he sells it you know, to his own private. He's one of these guys from the 70s that are kind of forgotten because either they don't have the hustle, not saying that he doesn't, but a lot of the guys don't have the hustle or the connections or they even want to be to talk to this bougie guy that's having a show in a gallery. So they've kind of missed the boat and they kind of missed the boat on the money where the early 80s guys, we talked about the pioneers who now are older gentlemen with, you know, a ton of work that have been to Europe and been collected. Uh, You know, T-Kid is just a perfect example who is one of these guys that have done it from the very beginning, Futura, very beginning, Crash, very beginning, mm-hmm. Sam, very beginning, and now they are in a lot of part of their lives 23 years ago, and they're real artists that are still doing their graffiti artwork as their main vocal in their art. Sure, sure. So you, you mentioned a little bit about your The tag style we're going back at. You know, yeah. I, I had a tag style that was just, you know, has morphed into something a little bit, you know, wilder, but it's basically, it's a letter, you know, one letter's bigger, the other one, and the end might have an end. Now you've got the, you got, you got this Keon piece, which is done uh, from the writer Crane from Uptown, from his, this is not my best piece, it's kind of a, a, a simple, this is not really a bubble letter for me. Sure. Uh, I will show no, you more not. of a bubble letter if we turn the page, but this was done at, um, it's in the Bronx, the old time. Yeah, this Bronx. is 149th Street, yeah, yeah. Austin Place, South Bronx. Case 2 and this, Memorial. It was a Case 2 tribute. Tribute, yeah, 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 yeah. I don't know what did I was you, thinking. That might character? have been Checker's Pot, I don't did, know. Did you do the character? I did the character, but that's supposed to be from a picture of Stay High. It doesn't look anything like him, but, you know, the color's right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a cool character. Yeah, yeah. I, I thought that was, since it was a tribute to Case 2, you were yeah. going to do a Case 2, but you actually well, got Stay High. I mean, I mean, I meant case two. I didn't mean stay high. <laughs> oh, okay. All right. Yeah, no, you were to say. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah. so anyway, I, I, if, you, if you could flip to any one of them. Is this from the Instagram? That's from my photography. Oh, yeah? Yeah. I, oh, I, yeah. I, I just have one. Yeah, yeah. You. you got maybe an another action. one. I got you an action. Oh, it got me an action. Yeah. Okay. Action Jackson, baby. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, uh, yeah. And uh, I think I even have you uh, painting, but keep, keep talking. Yeah. All right. Well, uh, you know... Um, when I was let into X Vandals, I got let in with Chain. Mm, uh, chain, okay. Chain, okay. chain, chain and me got into Chain. Three. We got into the same thing, and you know, I'll tell you that for me personally, I have more work now as someone that shouldn't even be thinking about that. I should be thinking about my mortgage and my wife complaining about the flowers around the white picket fence. <laughs> but um, I have, we have more opportunity now, especially with cans and especially with the caps that give you a fine line and not just the same line, da 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 da. Yeah. Um, we have, can take your time. I don't think, I like, I don't like to think that I take too much time because for me, graffiti was always fast. Like Rocky said, it's hit and run. You know, you sure. didn't have time for that. And that's the way it was back when I was a young teenager. Absolutely. It was hit and run. There was, well, that's the same piece, but yeah. that's a... Uh, that's you're working on it. That's, uh, it. that's, you know, putting up a little bit of an outline, and this is not what I'd like to represent me. Sure, But nevertheless, sure. Uh, I could find you something on the Instagram if Kurt would be so kind to find that and then blow something up. <laughs> okay, I'll do All right, now let him do his work, because yeah. I'm getting tired. I need a sip of coffee and a cigarette. <laughs> Maybe we could take a pause over here, Steve. I'm not a work Let's pause. <laughs> Tell me when you go. All right, so we were talking about, you know, uh, I had to answer to my father. And his name was Big Al, because he was big. Not like the rest of your small, he was a big guy. And uh, I knew I was going to get a what for if I was caught doing anything. So I had, you know, like a lot of these other kids that are, regardless, I won't speak about their families, but I had someone I had to answer to. Yeah. 
Yeah. You know, and that's that's the bottom line. So you know, I could only be so mischievous without, and I damn well wasn't going out at two in the morning. Yeah. So I had a little bit differently. Yeah. And you, you, yeah. you said you said you had um, a story about the first time you went out to a. Yard. Well, listen, I'm not I'm not going to put Joust in jeopardy because you know he was already you know running around like a little street, and he had something to answer to too. Yeah. His mother. Oh, okay. His mother. So you know. We both came from, well, a two-parent family. Yeah. And it's, it's a little bit different than if you're just being kind of not supervised and being brought up and you can run the muckety-muck. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, I ran a muckety-muck, but I didn't run a crazy muckety-muck. Yeah. So and, when, uh, right. So when you started your art career, were you selling paintings too? But not graffiti style, just for... Another? No, you know, I separated, like I had said before, I was not... A big writer. I mean, I was a writer. All right. But I had, I have my place, and it was not uh, king of a line. It was not all city. It was not like, oh shit, I remember you to the death. You know, <laughs> it wasn't like that. I was just a part of the culture. <clears throat> okay. I was, a, a, you know, like I was talking about the skateboard. It was an underground kind of, you know, rebellious kind of thing. Ain't nobody was riding a skateboard. I don't want to bring. It, but it was just, it was different for me. Yeah. Uh, to answer your question about the paintings, I started to sell paintings fairly early, fairly early, and uh, I'm a pretty good hustler at it, and I was much more aggressive at it than I am now because my window work on the street has taken you know, me to a, a level of compensation monetarily that I can survive on. Sure. Mm. And uh, I, I have uh, sold in a bunch of nice collections. I was a couple famous people and Henry Chiffant, bless you Henry, uh, had just bought two paintings from me which I'm uh, elated to be in his own private collection. I think it's, uh, it's, a, it's a, um, a very big compliment when somebody of that stature or any stature will dip into their pockets such as Cope II, yeah. the famous bomber Cope II, everyone knows Cope, what's up Cope? Uh, he bought a canvas from me and um, so uh, you know, that's just how it how it is. This is one of the paintings that uh, that Henry Chiffant bought, and I was doing kind of a gangland black and white series. And this is one of them. Uh, okay, yeah. So and they uh, are a little abstracted from an original black and white picture that other people uh, that have been doing it have kind of captured. Yeah. And uh, I've taken little bits and pieces and then turned it into a, a, a canvas. And Henry had bought that one and. Uh, what size is it, like 24 by 3? Yeah, 30? it's 3 by 3. Okay, okay like 36 by 36. And, um, okay, that's pretty big. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, um, this is a piece that is a little bit more to your uh, bubble style letter, oh, okay. which I kind of call sure. it a bubble Texas kind of style. I don't know why I call it that. Okay. Nothing else to call it. Is that's, that a wall or that's, canvas? That's a, on a wall. That's in Philadelphia. Oh, it looks like a different old, city, yeah. Old, old, old time is day. Oh, actually, no, that was uh, on uh, 116th under the uh, one train. Oh, okay, okay. And, uh, you know, get a little grate that everybody <laughs> has a little grate. And there's a yeah. Rocky Tag and a bomb one who is Al Diaz Samo, who, mm. by the way, is the original Samo. I know that John Michelle gets a lot of credit, but it started with Al Diaz. Bomb one. Uh -huh. yeah. And uh, do you have any uh, window signs in there that you uh, painted? Uh, yeah, I do. Well, you know, just for a quick reference, you know, you get murals inside of stores and pizzerias. I don't have all of the money in Sweden, but this is a pizzeria. Oh, that's, that's pretty good. Yeah, man. you know, Italy, and uh, here goes another one of Venice. So I make my living, like I said, as a an artist. That's Europe. Well, it's Venice. Yeah, I haven't been to Venice yet. Roxanne is planning on me going to Venice because yeah. she hears it's for lovers. <laughs> but it's not Brooklyn. No. It's not Brooklyn. No, no, no. It's not Brooklyn. It's no, no, no. Brooklyn. And uh, here goes the painting of the Guardian Angels that Cope II had bought. Oh, okay, okay. Sure, so, sure, sure. You know, this is another canvas. It's also three by three. And, um, you know, I sell them privately. And here goes another one of that series. It's if you get close up to it, you can see that I could I have tagged up uh, 
Mighty Whitey, who goes by the name of uh, Mike171, SJK, and Snake, who's another collector of mine, Snake. He didn't pay for it, though. <laughs> now, he invites me every year to his barbecue. He figures I ate enough money in hamburger, he don't have to pay for it. Yeah, yeah. Right, right, right. And, uh, so we got this one. And uh, this one, uh, this one uh, is another one of them. And this is a scully scene. Oh, sure, sure. Yeah. That's nice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. You got stitch, you yeah. got and uh, let's see. Uh, these are some more little pieces and here goes my sweet love and that's in her kitchen and that canvas is gone because Henry bought that one too. Mm -hmm. wow. Okay. Okay. She told me it was her canvas and I said, Not unless you pay me. Here goes <laughs> here goes another style and it's just kind of, you know, like a simple letter and you can see when I was referring back to the seventies guys like Riff and Cliff and Comet and Blade and you know, there's a handful of others that my you know simpleton of a mind can't go back and think about now. Sure. But you can see that you know there's arrows and there's a little blick and you know a lot of graffiti right now for me has reached its pinnacle mm. of how to shape up the letter M or how to you know shape up any letter. It's a lot of repetitive stuff for me personally. It's still beautiful. Yeah. I still love it. I have bitten off it. I have you know used it. Uh, but uh, here goes another piece, and this is at uh, Dennis Stumpo, which is now Tune, MPC. That's his sure. wall now. Dennis has moved to Florida and is sunning outside in his backyard with the alligators. <laughs> and um, See you on the this wall, is a, no. this is another wall with the spray paint. And remember, I probably couldn't have done this with the paint that a guy like Lee used back in the day on the train, just because yeah. it just was not happening. And your canvas is you use brush. So Right. Yeah, well, there's no rush for it. You know, you oh, take you, your time. You take your time with the brush. Here goes yeah. a Rocky and Keon piece. And this is the BP uh, wall, barbershop wall down, down on the uh, uh, thing. And this is one of my graffiti canvases, which are not too many because that's not kind of who I'm selling myself. But as you can see, it's a little cartoon of me and the rock. Oh, yeah. And we're hanging by a wall and a radio. And we've got our tags on the brick wall. And here goes another canvas, which is called uh, Urban Warfare something to that effect and he's jumping on a trampoline with which is a mattress I don't know if you can see <laughs> sure, that. sure mattress and buildings and then the wall writers uh, had me because um, they were being interviewed with Cheech and Chong and we did them a little bamboo canvas and uh, Mikey took it with Stephen SJK and then they went uh, to Europe and I mean uh, to Cheech and he was holding up here was another piece a Keon piece well, you can see it's kind of got a little bit of a bubble. It's not the uh, another one, but remember these are all legal walls, and uh, you know I don't have the I have the luxury of standing there not being chased out of a train yard. Sure. Where absolutely. most of these people that I've spoken about, and you also know your history of people that were all city or kings, or really did a lot of work on the train itself as their canvas or whatever you want to call it, they were able to do, and. Uh, you know, some more if you can blow up that. But that's really interesting that you, you took a different look you took a different way yeah, than well, other, other artists did well you know something it's because I was schooled and really schooled like that you could be an artist and this is how you do it but remember they never oh. promise you anything no, nothing is promised when you're an artist for yourself you have to make your own you have to get your own studio you have to pay your own rent there's a lot that goes into other, being an artist and on top of taking time yeah now, I do, I do work because uh, I, I got the idea from MK, who I'm not very friendly with, I might add, but he was the first guy that I saw do the subway map work. Oh, sure, right. sure, sure. And when I was friendly with him, we, uh, I, I kind of bogged the idea, well, I can do a subway map, and I ended up taking it to a different level where I was putting, if you were buying anything that you want on that subway map, and here's a Batman subway map that was sold to a guy, a collector in Florida, and, uh, so you covered the whole map? Yeah. Oh, yeah. I covered the whole map. Yeah, all right. In essence. In essence, yeah, yeah, yeah. This interview, I'm trying to cover the whole map. Yeah, I, I, yeah. I can't see the train lines. Right. Like, this is this is on the train. This is uh, at the Tats Crew Crew. Uh, yeah, 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 sure. Oh, in the backyard. The in the backyard. Another one yeah. is uh, on the BP. And we, you know, I've really gotten... Uh, this is, uh, this is a series of the coronavirus, which was not really too popular because of the death and destruction that it brought with us, but this is, you know, part of the coronavirus series on the subway map, and you can see they're washing hands, and uh, there goes Roxanne, and we were, we, when we travel, we see if we can, well, she usually goes to the manager of the, of the, uh, 
of the uh, facility that was there, the hotel, and she goes right to the department where they you know, do the fixing. She she asked the guy for the spray paint, and of course she smiles her pretty white teeth, and she gets whatever she wants. So we did this in the Turks and Caicos Island, and uh, uh, let's see what else we got over here. Uh, there was a picture of Poke. I don't know if you can get close into that. That's Poke from the Go Club, graffiti outstanding geo, and uh, rest in peace. There goes lava, and. Uh, by, the, by England's best, this is Trans. Trans is coming here pretty soon to paint the town. And uh, he, this is by Trans. Now he's, he is probably the best illustrator that you've ever seen with uh, some aerosol cans. And anyone can go to his website, uh, Trans World, and uh, I think that's Trans World, but it's Trans Graffiti, right. uh -huh. and you will see his amazing work. It's, it's, it's simply amazing. Here goes another coronavirus series where you have the kids playing in the uh, outdoor summer fun in the fire hydrant and everyone's got the masks on. Now, last one you... you so then I put artwork on top of a lot of the Hanna-Barbera characters. Mm. But that last, the one with uh, trans, you put x Vandu there. Well, he did that for me. Oh, he did, did that, that for you? Okay, name. yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, right. I wish you guys could see the old school freedom piece that I have someplace in the house, but Roxanne hides things, so I don't know where she's got it. <laughs> As long as she doesn't get my grubby hands on it. And then, of course, you know, this is some more artwork and the characters, and then I tag up people's names. And a lot of people see this and they go, well, Where's my name? You didn't tag me up. <laughs> you, know, you know, you get more maps. And so, this is how I make a lot of my living by. Yeah, I like it, man. I like you know, it. It's, it's, a, it's a different spin is, from the. Right, you know, this is you know, another character that's not mine, Harley Quinn from Women's Lib, and da 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 da. And her parents bought that for this young lady. And same pink parents Panther. bought the pink, pink Panther, Panther, and the Panther. same people. You know, there she goes, with the little princess for the princess. And you get the idea. So uh, here goes another Keon piece. That's this is nice done at the wall. Yeah. And you know, it's a little bubbly. These are the coronavirus kind of things going around. And uh, you got the Cuomo, and you got uh, another, that, another jazz band that was the same woman that bought that. And another coronavirus series and social distance and keep your ass behind me. And this is the most interesting one that there are six letters in the corona. And this is the third letter in the alphabet, the whatever backwards, the 18th letter in the alphabet. And if you add it up six, 66, it's 999. You get that? Oh, wow. Mm. Sign of the devil. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The lung and the vaporator that you're on, and of course the Lysol can. Uh, a little bit more key on with the characters, which are not mine, they're just, you know, sure. copied. You should do and, an expedition uh, of the COVID stuff, because it, it tells a story. The COVID, well, I've got a lot of them. You should have like an expedition. Now, if you break out your wallet, I could do a few more. I'll give you one. You buy two, you get one free. And then the, you got, of course, the mask. And here goes one from the uh, X Vandell's wall out in uh, Bushwick, Brooklyn. Uh, big shout out to Cool Keto. It was just his birthday the other day. All right. And, uh, uh, of course, uh, you got the Irish, uh, the Irish thing. But I don't have any Irish in me. It's all Italian and Swedish. The only Irish I have in me was uh, Nancy McGillicuddy out in <laughs> Hampton Bays. She was all into me. <laughs> Uh, you had a little video of uh, panic, and uh, you know oh, this was a uh, was a, another kind of piece that you had in the video at the wall. So I've really gotten fortunate to have met a lot of people that were my childhood idols. Yeah. And the Black Panther on a map, and you get the idea. Yeah, that's the good. And, man. You know, the, the Rocky piece. Yeah. You know, she can't. She 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 she's just uh, she's just Rocky. You know, one eighty four. She she's just another kid from Nights. She had a whole her own her own wall. Well, you know what? She That's does more her, than she a tag. Does, she more. does her own stuff. Oh, she has her own stuff. Okay. Yeah, she does. And, you know, All right, that's cool. You got cool. a bunch of fucking derelicts. Yeah. I like Bomb Five and Duster and <laughs> Kid Seventeen and Nick is even in that picture. And you know another map. You know they. I just have hundreds and hundreds of maps. And there's some of my window work. You know, this is uh, uh, from the Easter, from Easter windows, and uh, what else kind of crap we got on here? You know, uh, more maps, and there's a portrait of Rocky. She doesn't like it. I didn't make her pretty enough, you know. <laughs> well, there she goes, the rocks. And uh, there's Samo, Al Diaz, mm. bomb one, original. Uh, you've seen the Scully piece, and there goes plot 162, who we are not friends anymore. Mm. But it got a good map, there's another camp. But I've had the, I've had the... Uh, I've had the, uh, the, uh, the luck of being able, here goes some more window work, of luck of being able to piece on legal walls too to get my yippies out. That's great. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah here yeah, goes yeah. another one. This was in Hackensack, New Jersey of uh, Rocky. And uh, got the X-Vandos crew. 
then we got the portrait of Tea Kid in this new book that I'm working on. It's the portrait of writers. Mm. And uh, here goes a picture of Quick. Mm. You know Lynn Quick? But I've heard, He's I heard moving around. He's all over the place. You he, never know where I heard, he is. I heard the name. An underdog, you know? Oh, sure. Yeah. You know, sure. his girlfriend's name was Sweet Polly Pyramid. It's kind of like my mom. I used to love underdog. Yeah, I lived out in law in, uh, in California. Had to become a Raider fan. <laughs> and this is for the famous Gun Two Two Nine, who was one of the original guys that I friended and did a map of his name. And Scotty Bags smokes more weed than you can possibly imagine. And there goes Rocky That's tagging Rocky. trucks now. If her mother or the father that she stole money in the post office from knew that she was doing this. He would have passed over in the grave. <laughs> and, uh, you know, so you got some more shit and uh, you know, people that buy the maps and that sound. And this is the last one I'm going to show you because, you know, she made me do this. Went and stole the paint. Oh, that's right. The Club Med in Punta Cana. Vinci <laughs> Boys. You know, it's, in, it's interesting because in her oral history... Uh, she uh, suggested you uh, who, who gets the paint at the... Uh, no, she always blames me for something she does make her look good. Writer's <laughs> Corner, WC 188. So you get the idea. So we, you know, we've both have been around and you know, some more window windows and just... Hempstead, Long Island. Whatever it is for money, guys, that's what it is. Whether you're doing an <laughs> interview, you're painting a Christmas window, you're painting a... Uh, a menorah, whatever you're doing, whatever it takes, you make the money back. Absolutely. Like and that's the story about it. To, uh, um, some of the MG so, boys. going back yeah. a little bit to uh, today. your early writing days, yeah. um, do you remember, uh, what, what was it like picking up a, a spray paint can and, and trying to, to write with it for the first time? If you, you know, if you it was, it was uh, I don't know, it was just a tool that seemed to come easy for me personally, a spray okay. can being the tool, you, yeah. and uh, you know, I was a scared little Nelly, so I did it fast. Sure. And... Uh, you know, I usually kind of went solo with that, with, except for, for Joust when we got a little bit older. Yeah. And um, it was, you know, it wasn't a hard thing. It was a can of spray paint. It's not like I was sure. doing it on a unicycle. Sure, sure, sure. Are, are, there, are there colors that you were drawn to or that you're still drawn to? You know to what? When it comes uh, to that? I think that black spray paint is always an important color to have uh -huh. in your repertoire. Yeah. Uh, I do like bright colors, but they didn't make those kind of colors when I was writing. So whatever you could get, black, white, red, blue maybe, yeah. green, those were the kind of colors that you might have used. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I also too had a friend when I was probably you know, anywhere from 16 to 19 that worked at a local hardware store. Mm. And he kind of ran stuff, so the gate was always open. There was wow. no need for me to get arrested which is a lot of guys stories that you know it was all about the racking for me it's all about getting it free if you have if you got a friend in need you got a friend indeed <laughs> absolutely yeah. did, did you ever get in any kind of trouble for uh, writing you know something i didn't okay yeah 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 i didn't get into too much trouble even though i caused a lot of it yeah like i said i had <clears throat> someone to answer to but i find myself uh, a cool dude that knew how to evade trouble. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wow. That's because I'm slick. I don't <laughs> care who's looking in. I am slick, motherfucker. How about that? <laughs> so, so how would you sum up uh, your life in street art, graffiti culture? How would you sum up the 40 years that you've been involved with this culture? Well, and I'll how tell you, you what. For yourself and... You know, it's an interesting point because... You had just mentioned to me, Kurt, that you have a beautiful new um, collector who's the Cooper Union School, which is a fine educational institution and well-known, like art and design, like Pratt, like visual arts. It's a, Cooper Union is a, is a, is a hard and expensive place to get into, and they just bought some of your stuff, a collection of a black... Black graphic designer. Yeah. Black graphic designer. And it's funny how now in today's time, especially with the counterculture and Black Lives Matter that the black as a race and the Spanish have come a long way as far as I'm concerned. But back in the early 80s when there was the Soho Chic Art Gallery which is now switched into all 
clothing stores and bulletproof fucking eyeglasses or whatever they have you now. The galleries have moved on, like I had said before to you earlier. The galleries went from Soho, they crossed into the East Village, which crossed into Williamsburg, which went into Greenpoint, which now goes into Bushwick. <clears throat> so there's a lot more art. You see a lot more street art. There's a lot more legal availability. There's a lot more shine for people who just kind of come out once in a while yeah. and can have a big mural when you have suffered and cut off your ear in your studio and how do I get that? There's a lot more politics because of the time that we're in. It was different. You didn't see any street art back in the early 70s, mid-70s. You didn't see that. Yeah. It was billboards and fucking graffiti that made a neighborhood look like it was war-torn. Yeah. <laughs> and I will want to go back to just to one thing, that in my neighborhood, one of the rowdy kids would hang out at the, he wasn't really rowdy, but, you know, as a young white kid, he looked rowdy because he was black and sat in the corner with another bunch of other kids. Yeah. But on my skateboard, I used to go to that store every day as a young kid, back on Church Avenue, Ocean Parkway. And one of my good friends at that point became was Dynamite Spear, Gary Valentine, who just recently passed. Mm -hmm. And uh, um, do you guys know who Spear is? No. He was a Brooklyn writer, along with Ken and I.E. and Pinto and Staff and Nako, and from that ex Vandels neighborhood, The Block, and Dino Nod, and Scooter, and all the people I had mentioned, Wicked Gary. Um, what am I rambling on about? You're talking about uh, summing up the 40 years. I the 40 years, well, there's just a lot more, uh, there's just a lot more opportunity now for people, and I was going back to your point that back in the early 80s in the the art culture, there wasn't that many blacks that were into this. There were a lot of black painters and black artists, but you really heard about the bourgeois, 57th Street, Soho, and these artists, that the black artist was not prevalent in that white, sure. wor in that white world, so yeah, to yeah, speak. Sure, yeah, sure. yeah, yeah, yeah. And so when I was growing up through visual arts, I was enthralled. Well, not enthralled, that's the wrong word for it. I not only worked for these, but I saw that white world that didn't have too many blacks in it. It wasn't a very, uh, a rounded field, which you see today. Yeah. It's because of opportunity. And it's also because of, I don't know, how people are paying much more attention and praising like their, you know, Lord Jesus Christ, street artists. Yeah. which are now using a lot of the aerosol, which is a different vibrancy, and it's a different kind of application, and they're not you know, like an old sign painter on a brick wall like myself that are doing it in brush. It's spray paint, whether it's on gates. Um, so congratulations to you going all over the place as far as having Cooper Union buy your stuff. But just in that white world, how I would go back to my 40 years, I've struggled. I've been most of the time broke. You know, I've made my living as a meager artist. Um, I lost my studio back in the late 90s and have not returned into a studio environment. And uh, I've had a couple of things happen to me physically, uh, operations uh, on joints and bones that have slowed me down. And uh, I just haven't gotten back into it because if I wanted a studio now, I might want to even go into Hunts Point over the last you know, nine years I've been living in the Bronx. I've been thinking about it every day, I just don't go and do it. Sure. Because it's a whole different, you know, it's like a real artist is very self-centered. And a real artist is very, it has to have a studio, has to have a place which is another rent. And it's like being married. As an artist, you're married to your artwork. Um, it takes a lot of time. And do I have time? I've got time, but I've got other things that I do other than sending me out to my studio for an eight-hour day. When I was a little bit younger, I had that time, and I was focused on doing this. I not, not that I've lost focus, but I've had my focus in a different direction. I'm working smaller, and I'm doing more painting than I am the lumbersome kind of other artwork. Sure. And uh, that's pretty much the story. It's a, it's a simple story. I think a lot of people have that. Um, but I, I struggled, and um, I'm my own success now. And a lot of your success comes from how much you hustle and sell yourself. Like the way I hustled you guys into getting an interview. <laughs> made, made a little bit of money. Whether it's meager or a lot, Yeah, I still yeah. got the money. Yeah. 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 Check is in the pudding. <laughs> I, 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 I don't know what I'm talking about, yeah. but just 
uh, in, in your personal life, you, you know, you struggle. Did you did you raise a family? Uh, well, I did. It's a subject that I am not going to talk about. Uh, okay, that's fine. I was married for uh, a long time to one of my high school, to a high school sweetheart, and uh, had two kids. One is twenty, and God bless her, she has a full scholarship to University of Southern California, USC, where I hope that she's doing well. We don't speak, nor do I speak to my son or ex-wife any longer. It's a court thing. It's a monetary thing. It's just a uh, they. They, the wife poisoned me and that kind of thing. So I, um, but uh, now I'm in a very happy relationship, and I happen to love Roxanne, Rocky One Eighty Four, Patterson, Joe Bear, very much, and uh, we get along nice, and we're able to travel in the summertime, and we enjoy that, and that's uh, the best part of life as far as building a relationship, companionship, and you know the things other than your ordinary. Let's go to the show. <laughs> blah, 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 blah. Yeah. Okay. And y- y'all met, was it through Wall Riders? That <laughs> no, she stalked met? me on Facebook. <laughs> I see you laughing now, Roxanne. No, she had her number out on Facebook, and you know, I saw her because she was in California, yeah. and she was at the, uh, it might have been the Red Bull opening for the Wall Riders, mm. which she is definitely a Wall Rider. Let's get no mistake about it. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> She's the only girl out of that whole crew, yeah. and she can hold her own. And if you are not nice to me, she probably will come kick some ass. All right. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, her story was true in an interview. Make sure you're watching on YouTube. And uh, you will get a good story from those wall writers. They have a lot more neighborhood kind of graffiti stories to tell you, so to speak. Sure. I have graffiti stories, but at this point in my life, it was just something that you did as a kid. Yeah. It's something you do now, older, but it's in a different kind of concept. It sure. Is, you know? it's a different, sure. Different thing, you know? Yeah, and you 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 talked you know a lot about it being the kind of underground youth culture. That's right. Similar to skateboarding. Why why don't you talk a little bit bit more about skateboarding? Because that was clearly a large part of your your childhood as well. Yeah, that Where was you'd a very, skate, that was, that was a very things, large. Yeah. Uh, and I don't know if you can. Uh, you know what? I'm tired of this phone. This guy, nothing. But yes, it, it was a it was a big thing. You know, uh, it, it was a, a big thing, and nobody did it when I was doing it, especially down Flatbush Avenue. Yeah, Andy Kessler was the early Andy Kessler, yeah, he was pioneer. Yeah, yeah. Well, of, of street. They called him the pioneer because, like I said, the boards had changed. Yeah. You know, the guys in California were the real pioneers, but we were, and I'm speaking of Andy Kessler, and I'm speaking of a lot of other people that you wouldn't well, know, the, the, but the, they the, were the pioneer, and it really, our 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 stomping grounds was in Central Park. Sure. Because of the hills there, and there was an audience. And if you ever go in the streets, whether you're in Soho or Williamsburg, there's always a bunch of kids showing off. Why? Because they want to be seen. Absolutely. Kind of like a graffiti artist. Absolutely. Writes the name because they want to be seen. Yeah. So did you ever ride a shut skateboard? A what? A shut. Shut skateboard. No, I was Rodney in... Rodney Smith. No, no, there. no. I was and into the uh, the Bunger skateboard, the uh, the er- Logan Erski, the Fiberflex, the okay. Jay Adams. okay. And uh, your Sims boards and your, uh, that's about that. So the Zoo York crew was in the that z- area. The Zoo York crew in is, the is, is right, right. in between, you know, uh, 69th Street to 98th Street, yeah. right. 104th yeah. Street. The, the kids that lived on the Upper West Side, basically, or some of the East Side kids were, which is, there's a big difference. The West Side kids were a little bit more mischievous, more avant-garde were a little bit more rebellious and the east side kids were a little bit more debutante if if you must but there were some pretty good writers and rich kids that came out of that upper east side environment and don't get me wrong they were just as good and as rowdy never mind if you come from money or you don't come from money Mm -hmm. it's about you not your parents money not because you're making so much money at 16 on wall street (laughs) <laughs> you know, it's, you know, people people have problems, no matter if you're rich or poor, and those problems become infested in you, which brings out, and basically that's what graffiti stems from. Yeah, it was yeah. artistic yeah, yeah. and an art form, but those kids didn't make it the art form. The writers that came to New York that documented that put that art on a map because they realized that it was an art form and made everybody's rebellion kind of shine. 
And there's really nothing more to it. Yeah. Except, like I said, in the 80s, when people such as T-Kid or definitely Lee or guys that were using caricatures. And a lot of them didn't use characters to those guys, especially Lee's um, uh, maturity. Sure. You saw a lot of side profiles of kids' heads. And you always see them in kind of glasses or ski glasses. Yeah. And it's funny how you mentioned ski glasses because the word ski is a slang for cocaine. Mm. And to ski is up in Vermont. And sure. you need money in a bourgeois crowd to ski. So there's two different kinds of skiing. Yeah. Have you ever thought about it? <laughs> now, I ask a lot of people this question. Where were you when Wild Style Movie came out and Style Wars? Because Style Wars... Style Wars came out in the 80s. Yeah, what were you doing right I was working at the Roxy, which means I was roller skating. I had just started visual arts. I had just gotten my studio, and I was... Did you see the movie, or you didn't... You know something? I saw the movie Wild Style. Well, I saw Wild Style... First. Right, first. And to this day, I've never seen Style Wars. Uh, is that is that is that is that a, a fucking knucklehead? That's you know, but you know something. I know those people, and yes, I know right. the history. Yes, so right. I don't really need to see the movie. You were there <laughs> because my DVD player broke. Oh, okay, I got you. <laughs> I did see Led Zeppelin. The song remains the same, and I was high as a kite in my yeah, 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 yeah. I went to the uh, what was that? The planetarium. Yeah. You know they were playing the Pink Floyd. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah, you got that one. Yeah, you got that one. I just never saw it. But Roxanne in the house has every graffiti book given to her and signed by the people who made it. Who made it. And it's on our coffee table. I've never even picked up one. <laughs> you kidding me? No, I'm not kidding you. Do I look like I'm kidding? <laughs> Come on, man. That's Come on. funny. <laughs> well, I hope that I've been helpful. Is there any one last question that you want to ask the kid? Uh, you got a question? You're in the Bronx. We're at the Bronx this talk with society. What, what do you think of the Bronx? Well, I'll tell you what. The Bronx closes up early. So does Brooklyn, for that matter. Mm-hmm. The Bronx is a lot like Brooklyn, that it's not now, but it's a lot of separation over a bridge or through a Bruckner Expressway to Manhattan. It's always quieter. Like, I remember taking the train from Manhattan to Brooklyn and crossing the bridge back over the moat. Brooklyn had a different flavor. It had all ethnic areas. Mm -hmm. Now downtown, but especially now, has built up to Cosmopolitan. I can't afford to live there. I don't want to live with the bike lane anymore. The bike lane hasn't really come up to the Bronx yet. Mm-hmm. So the, it's kind of similar in that it's a borough which is not clustered Manhattan, but the Bronx is a little bit more mellow mm-hmm. the way Brooklyn used to be. And remember, the Bronx is upstate more or less. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's north. Where Brooklyn, we had the coast right there. We had Coney Island. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so Brooklyn has a little bit flatter where the Bronx is a little bit more tree. Sure, absolutely. Yeah. So there's a different kind of flavor. And Queens was always kind of countryside, yeah. and still to this matter is, with the private homes, and I mean, Bronx and Brooklyn private homes, but it's a little bit more grassy and tree because it's leading into Long Island. Sure, sure. Whereas Staten Island is his own, you know, own it's his own fucking place, if you know what I mean. Absolutely. And uh, what, what did we forget? Brooklyn, Staten Island, Manhattan? It's all in the wall. It's all in the wall. New York City. You got yeah, it New York all. City. But it's all in one. So if there's an argument about where the best is, where the best is, who is the best, there was a lot of guys from Queens and Brooklyn that don't get the recognition in the books that that they deserve. And not only do they deserve, but the cultural writings of documentation. A lot of people are dead. Mm -hmm. A lot of of people have died. And uh, you're not going to get the full story from guys that I saw growing up. Yeah. Um, and for that, the culture loses something 
with all the different variations coming from different boroughs that are different places. Usually Manhattan gets it. So the Bronx, I'm not particularly fond of it because I grew up my whole life in Brooklyn and Manhattan. My grandmother lived in Park Chester as I was a little kid. I, oh, wow. Well, a young, young, young teenager. Too young with all this street fire that you see going on, going through the neighborhoods from Brooklyn up to Park Chester where she lived. And um, I saw a lot of early stuff taking the train up there. I mean, yeah. Graffiti was something that I was always enthralled by. Whether it was, how did he get into this? Look at this motherfucker running through a tunnel to tag in between. The abandoned stations that people have gone into. I've only yeah. been to one. That was Myrtle Avenue mm -hmm. and, uh, in Brooklyn by DeKalb. And um, what were they saying? Are you saying about you're finishing up? Yeah, just finishing up. Man. It's just that, you know, there is a, there is a lot of um, people in the scope of things when you read about graffiti books. A lot of them are mentioned, but there's a lot of people, and I'm talking about more like the early 70s guys. Sure. The new street writers don't get any credit. Yeah, yeah. And there's a lot of new bombers, especially uh -huh. after the, uh, the pandemic. Absolutely. There is stuff done on the street that you wouldn't think about doing. Yeah. Not only ballsy, but just because it, you, you just... The, it, the street wasn't a canvas. Now the street, like this, the artwork and the... the, the um, the, the, the collective in Brooklyn, these big street fairs that are glorifying people that are just average artists. And remember, I, I'm, uh, the artists are a dime a dozen, including myself. There's a million artists. You know, building the sculpture, I got a little bit jaded from the, the work that it took when I would see sets on movies and the carpenters and the scenic designers that were building these things that I'm just a little fraction of a puzzle that's building something unique, but guys are so much better. Yeah. I'm going to be glorified. I'm just an average knucklehead. Just another average artist. Trying to make a nut. <laughs> That's good. You know, That's good. But, um, you know, there are there is a lot of talent. Whether you write graffiti, whether you write on the sidewalk, whether you do old master paintings and a copy a, a form of art that's been around. Um, you know, art is for art is for your soul. And you do it from your heart, and you do it because it's a passion, not to make money. You can make money, from, but that's where it comes from. And uh, to stay in the art game uh, is up and down. It's a beautiful thing, but that's personally who I am. It's my passion, and I know I do it fairly well, and I can make a little bit of money off it, and that's why it's kept me in the game. Plus, I don't know how to do anything else. Thank you, you. Peace out. Big shout out to the X Vandels. The uh, NSA crew, NCB, hello Roto, and uh, a big shout out to Rocky, to Frankie, to Shaman, to Roger, to Clyde. If I left you out, Re, don't forget Re too, Willpower, X Vandels, and we're out. Thank you guys for the interview. Thanks for the time. Hope the viewer audience liked that. Hope I could give them a little bit of something. Peace. Thank you.